Hello, everybody. Welcome to Convocation on this second day of December 2021. We're so excited to be able to welcome our guest, Dr. Bonnie K. Baxter, to, uh, to the stage today. However, before uh, we get started, uh, since this is the last convocation that we'll be meeting uh, for this semester, I do want to say thank you to some people. And I'm afraid I might leave some people out, but I've made a list. So I want to just uh, say thank you to our convocation TAs and this, uh, the students that we've had helping us scan for attendance this semester. And those are Aubrey, Stephanie, Amy, Avery, and Morgan. I'd also like to thank Ben Harris and the Eccles Tech crew, which is mainly Keston, Tyler, and Javin. So thank you so much for your help this semester. Also to Gary Chittister and the Snow TV crew, Jake and Jack. Uh, we appreciate you guys always being here and helping out. Also, I want to say thank you to the President's Office and to the Office of Academic Affairs for their support for the convocation program. Also to the Fine Arts Division that allow us to use this wonderful facility for our class. We really appreciate their generosity in allowing us to do that. And also all of the Eccles Center staff. Um, I'd also like to thank the Snow College Office of Marketing and Communications for all the things that they do, putting up the, uh, the signs on the TVs and, and also creating our lovely posters and everything. We really appreciate their work. They make everything look so great and professional. Also, I want to thank the Snow College uh, Food Services and Catering for the lunches that they provide for the speakers and the students who are able to attend. We really appreciate them. Um, also, Mid-Utah Radio, San Pete Messenger, and The Cage for all the advertising that they do for us. We appreciate that. I want to thank, uh, in particular, Dr. David Allred, who is the Convocation Coordinator Emeritus, uh, for all of his uh, advice and mentoring this semester. This has been my first semester doing this, so I really appreciate everything that he has helped me with, and also for stepping in a couple of weeks ago when I was unable to be present. Um, in addition, I want to thank the other Professor Badrero for his support uh, in this, this new assignment for me. I really appreciate everything that you have done. Thank you. And of course, to all of our speakers and presenters this semester, as well as those who have recommended speakers and presenters, thank you so much. And lastly, I want to thank all of you students. It's been fun to meet with you, to get to know you, and to have you here in class. So thank you. You've been a great audience this semester. And now I'd like to invite to the stage Dr. Bonnie Baxter. And while she's coming up here, I want to introduce you to her. Dr. Bonnie K. Baxter is a professor of biology at Westminster College. She has spent two decades studying microbial life in the extreme environment of Great Salt Lake. She has a long-standing interest in how microbes and their molecules are preserved in salt over geologic time. These discoveries have astrobiology implications as we explore Mars for potential life or biosignatures in salt deposits on the Red Planet. She founded and directs the Great Salt Lake Institute to facilitate research on the lake and provide outreach opportunities for science education. Please welcome Dr. Baxter. Thank you very much. I am awfully excited to be here to talk to you about what is a very interdisciplinary field. Um, and I, uh, I do spend a lot of time at Great Salt Lake, and uh, we've been in the news a lot lately because um, we're trying to get attention for the fact that the lake is shrinking, and uh, you may have heard it, it hit a record low this year. So um, I, I'm not talking about that today, but I wanted to invite you, if you have questions at the end, to ask about that as well. Um, in this case, in the case that I'm talking about, how Great Salt Lake is analogous to ancient salt lakes on Mars, um, I, it, it's really good that it's drying up, right? <laughs> right? Even though it's really bad in terms of what it says about our planet. So today I want to take you through um, two parallel stories, and one is about Great Salt Lake on Earth and this basin that holds it, and how the evaporation of water as this basin uh, loses water is very analogous to the story at the bottom about Mars' ancient salt lakes and how they dried up on the surface of Mars and also left behind big deposits of salt. We are finding biology trapped in salt, um, actually from ancient salt mines, 
around the world, as well as in modern salt, like in Bonneville Salt Flats and Great Salt Lake. And so that makes me curious about if these lakes dried up and left salt behind on Mars, what might be in that salt? And can we go find it? And that's actually what the Perseverance rover is up to. So I, I'll talk about that towards the end. So this is where we're going. We'll start on Earth and then we'll move to Mars. So to Mars we will go, but we will start on this planet. Um, I love this shot because Great Salt Lake was um, photographed from the International Space Station. And I, I like it because it's in the context of planet Earth, and you can see actually how big this basin is. Um, you can see Salt Lake City is here. I'm going to use this screen for pointing, but I know the colors are better on these screens, so feel free to look to the side. Um, Salt Lake City is where that star is, and uh, the Wasatch Mountains that uh, deliver water to Great Salt Lake, um, I've marked those up there. That causeway across the lake causes the north part of Great Salt Lake to be at salt saturation because it limits the amount of water that comes in from the Wasatch to that region. So there's a physical construction across the lake that prevents water from getting to the north arm and that's gonna become important in our story. And that's, uh, that big flat is Bonneville Salt Flats. Uh, you may have heard of the speed races that happen out there um, has anyone in the audience been to Great Salt Lake? Raise your hands. Good. Has anyone been to see Robert Smithson's famous artwork, The Spiral Jetty, up in the North Arm? Yeah. So I spent a lot of time up there, and that's uh, where this beautiful pink water is. Um, and I'm curious about, uh, again, how this mimics um, an ancient system on Mars. And a lot of times what planetary scientists think about when they're thinking about another place in the universe is they go in their own backyard on their own planet and see what's accessible. So I'll say this about Earth. It is the only place in the universe where we have found life and we have a sample size of one. Everything that's alive on our planet is linked to some common uh, universal common ancestor, because all of us use DNA as genetic material. All of us use ribosomes to make our proteins. All of us use the same genetic code, from slime molds to humans. So you might think we have really many samples of life on our planet, but we actually essentially have one sample of life on our planet. And so the question is, did life erupt elsewhere? And that's a really wonderful question. So that's where we're headed. So uh, Great Salt Lake is an enormous watershed that fills uh, this Bonneville Basin. And during the last 800,000 years, there have been four big lakes in this basin, the last of which was Lake Bonneville. And you can see that outlined in the, um, the light blue color, the watershed the modern day watershed is outlined in the orange color. Um, and then Great Salt Lake is sort of that darker blue in the middle. So um, this, this last uh, large lake um, was Lake Bonneville, but really for 800,000 years, it's mostly looked like it does today. Mostly it's been this little puddle at the bottom of the bathtub that we call Great Salt Lake and the salt playa around. So glaciation in the Ice Age caused water to get trapped in this bigger basin of Lake Bonneville. As the earth warmed up, as the glaciers went away, um, the water evaporated and shrunk down to this salty puddle, right? So that's how we got to Great Salt Lake. Here's a, a picture uh, from Landsat images of Bonneville Salt Flats and Great Salt Lake. And you can see Utah Lake in this picture too, that was a, it's a part of that basin system. So it's a terminal lake. It doesn't have an outlet to the ocean. It's at the bottom of its watershed. This is a picture by Ken Kruak at um, uh, Utah Geologic Survey of Bonneville Salt Flats. And you can almost envision water having been above it and evaporating and then leaving salt behind. So now we have to go back to 
I don't know, second or third grade, whenever we learn the water cycle, remember that it's only water that evaporates. So the salt doesn't evaporate with the water, it gets left behind. And geologists call these evaporites um, because geologists have a habit of putting ite on the end of something to call it a rock, right? So it's a rock created by evaporation. Um, and it turns out that these evaporites don't just exist on our planet, but they've been very uh, finely mapped on Mars. Um, again, uh, Great Salt Lake is shrinking. This is a picture of 1986 next to a picture of 2016. Um, and the margins are shrinking in. And what that means for us who study life being dried up in salt is that we can find more salt. Great Salt Lake is also really, really shallow. This is why it's prone to so much evaporation. Its surface area is exposed. Um, and this is really different than other terminal lakes in the West. So that's another feature that's important here. Um, another picture from ISS, and you can see the north arm with its pink water. I'm going to talk about what makes it pink. I study those microorganisms that give the pink color. Um, this salty area right here is uh, where we spend a lot of time taking samples. And those of you who have been to see this artwork, the spiral jetty, that's the bay where it exists. Um, and, and so we've been looking in the salt crystals that form in there and other minerals that are forming in this evaporate as the lake is shrinking. The water really is pink. It is surreal to be out on a boat on this part of the lake. This is Gunnison Island in the, pa uh, in the background here. Um, and that color is caused by pigmented microorganisms. So we call them halophiles from the Greek, the root for salt and the root for love, because they literally love salt, right? So anybody know how salty the ocean is? Pretty salty. Have you ever gotten washed under a wave? It really feels awful, and you're like, this is the saltiest place in the world, until you go to this place. <laughs> it's 3.4% salt. So that north arm pink water can get in the summertime when it's warmer and more salts dissolve, it can get up to 34% salt, like 10 times saltier than the ocean. And the part that's near I-80, that's near Salt Lake City, um, even that part right now is at 16% salt. So this is one of our concerns about the lake drying up is that uh, even that south arm part is getting saltier and saltier and saltier and the invertebrates that live there and feed 10 million birds um, are at risk. So anyway, away from the ecology and back to the astrobiology, um, the, that railroad causeway uh, allows this one part of the lake to be at salt saturation. And the halophiles that grow there are extremophiles. They are living at the highest salt concentration where life can be, so they're living at the limit, right? So studying them can tell us something about the limits of life. Um, people used to say, life can't be on Mars because it's, there's you know, UV radiation. Well, we have, we have microbes on our planet that can deal with radiation. Well, my, you can't have life on Mars. It's, it's too cold. Well, we have microbes on Earth that live in Arctic ice cores. Um, well, you can't have microbes on Mars because there's a million reasons that are given, and now we find microbes that have overcome all of these obstacles. So our minds are opened to what actually could exist on Mars. And these archaea, which are not bacteria and are not eukaryotes like us and giraffes and your dog and yeast, um, this archaea is a group of organisms that have special adaptations, and many of them are extremophiles. So these are the ones that live in the acid hot pools of Yellowstone um, or in Great Salt Lake. So halophiles, uh, haloarchaea, um, are in that, that zone. And here's some growing in my lab, and you can see the uh, pink and orange and purplish colors that they have. And yes, that's the same as the color of the water. So. Um, one time I was flying over Great Salt Lake and the captain of the airplane uh, said on the speaker, 
If you look out the window on the right, you'll see this pink water of Great Salt Lake that is colored that way because of the brine shrimp. I got out of my seatbelt, I stood up, I was like, that's not correct. Anyway, you don't want to do that today on an airplane, but you got to educate people where they are, right? <laughs> Um, so we have isolated and others have isolated and have genetically identified many of these halo archaea that live in Great Salt Lake. And I won't bore you with um, the taxonomy because it bores me too. Uh, but I'm going to show you a few slides today from a chapter in a book that I wrote with some of my students, one of whom who spent two years at Snow College before she came to Westminster College. So I feel like she's a connector and she published um, about Haloarchaea and their superpowers, so we'll talk about that in a minute. So I do think they have superpowers. I think that they are amazing, and if we're going to think about life that can handle the challenges of a place like Mars, it's fun to think about life that are handling those challenges on our planet now. So I call them poly-extremophiles because they not only handle high salt, but they can handle drying up inside a salt crystal. Um, they, can, they can change the way they get energy. They can do some really cool tricks. So uh, I'm, I'm going to go through a couple of those. You can ignore the words that don't have meaning to you, but just so I remember to tell you some of the cool things they can do. So they have this lifestyle flexibility, I call it. Um, they actually can use perchlorates, which are found on Mars, so that's really important. They can make some free ATP. They don't care what the pH is. They're really quite flexible in their lifestyle. So they have, many of them have these little solar pumps that are solar operated that generate some free ATP. So not really photosynthesis, but some kind of rudimentary form of that. Um, these are some of them growing on a salt crystal in a salt lake uh, in Iran, Lake Urmia. Uh, but, and I just think the picture is so beautiful, showing the colors of the microbes growing in the salt. So the, the thing that they do that allows them to live in salt is officially called osmophily. This means like osmosis that they have a love of being in a high osmotic environment. So in other words, that makes them thrive. If you were to um, take all of your human cells and put them in Great Salt Lake, um, they would shrivel up and die. Um, you could probably swim your cells to the surface and you would survive for sure. But if we took some of your cells and put them there, they wouldn't tolerate it. So they, uh, the halophiles have develop some strategies to live at what we call low water activity. And they do some really funky things with their cells and their proteins in order to manage that. Um, and so they actually have little pumps that will pump the sodium out. And they'll tell potassium, the little Ks, they'll say, potassium, come inside. Help me balance with the salt outside because potassium is a friendly ion to life and sodium is not. So they do some really unique things and I do want to give a shout out to the algae and the fungi and the higher types of um, organisms, even the animals like brine shrimp and brine flies. There are some complicated cells that can live and do this kind of work, but not quite at the level of haloarchaea. So I did want to mention that there's some other other cells that can do that. I study in my lab radiation resistance. I've been really interested in how they uh, don't collect DNA damage when you shine UV lights on them. And um, my lab has sort of probed those mechanisms trying to figure that out. Um, and some of it has to do with those pigments. Those pigments that um, make the water pink also help, like an umbrella, shade, shade these cells from the sun. Um, I came out of the world of DNA repair, and so I'm really interested to know they have so many DNA repair mechanisms. They do it all really well, and they're very robust. So um, again, my lab has studied this. I won't go into the details of that, but a lot of it comes down to these pigments. So when you grow them in the lab, you see these pigments. And if you grow them in the light, um, 
on this image, which you can't see well here, you can see the cells growing really orangey color that they're growing in the light versus the ones that grow in the dark don't have as much pigment. So there's definitely an interplay with the light of their environment. Whoops. So one of the coolest things they do, halophiles, is they can survive inside salt crystals um, over geologic time. So these are some at the bottom that were imaged by my friend Tim Lowenstein and his students um, in New York, but it's from Death Valley. It's from a core that's 30,000 years old. And you can actually, he has videos, you can see the cells moving around inside the salt crystals. So there's a 30,000 year old cells. And there are people that have resurrected ones from 200 million year, 250 million year old salt. So super interesting that they can do some kind of long-term Rip Van Winkle kind of thing and we don't understand it completely. Okay, so back to Great Salt Lake and this salty area where my students and I get a lot of our salt and a lot of our pink water for samples. Um, I, are there geologists in the room? Oh, hey. Um, I, I uh, hang out with geologists a lot, but I don't really know geology. Um, and geologists do this really funny thing where they put humans in their pictures and they say human, human for scale. Well, I'm a molecular biologist, so for a scale bar to me is in microns, you know, and I, I just think it's funny that they use human beings as scale. For a long time, I thought geologists just really like selfies of themselves. You know, I couldn't figure that out, but it's, it's a legit thing, right? Humans for scale. Okay, so get this. I just published this, and don't tell George Lucas. Chewbacca for scale. That's my 1977 Chewbacca. <laughs> And he's 10, he's actually 10 centimeters tall exactly, so he makes a great scale bar, and I'm just doing that because my husband's a geologist and I have to make fun of him. Okay. Um, so we have some really cool minerals out at Great Salt Lake. Um, I did put a scale bar in one of these pictures. These are some of the coolest salt crystals. So if you go to some fancy grocery store or the fancy aisle in the grocery store, I'm sure you can buy some French sea salt, and there'll be these little chevrons that, you know, the, the French people collected with their hands, you know, and so it costs like a million dollars, and, and you take this and you sprinkle it on an avocado or something so that you feel really fancy. Well, that, that's the way salt crystals form in water, um, and at Great Salt Lake, about this time of year when the water starts to cool off, remember I said it was holding as much salt as it can? So when the water starts to cool off, the salt drops out of solution, and actually uh, we pick up these beautiful crystals um, on the, the bottom of the lake water, and they look like little pyramids. So they're quite, quite cool, and the, the bottoms of them, uh, the big ones in the middle, are about two centimeters uh, square. So um, it might not look like the salt you eat out of your salt shaker, but it is reminiscent of the fancy salt that, you, um, that people uh, collect from the surface of salt water. Um, so could this be trapping some water inside? And the answer is yes. So geologists that study minerals um, talk about fluid inclusions that get trapped inside the crystals, and this is actually where we think these microbes are living. Um, we also have gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, um, and it, it uh, is around the shores of that north arm of Great Salt Lake with the blades up, and you pull out the blades, and there are these beautiful crystals. Um, I have some that are like that big and some that are smaller, but there's one with a hand so you can see the scale of that. Um, as the lake is shrinking, we are finding these really intricate mounds in the winter um, where groundwater is bringing uh, sodium sulfate up and it's mirabilite. And these are looking like terraces at Mammoth Hot Springs. It's really cool. We've set up a trail cam to watch it form over time. Um, so that's another mineral that actually might be on Mars. 
Um, I've been studying with my lab um, these stromatolite-like structures in the lake that are made of carbonate. And we've been tearing them apart and finding all the microbes that are involved in building them, so that's been fun. So another mineral, calcium carbonate. All right, so that's for the geologist in the room. Um, and it turns out from all of those, we can culture a broad array of microbes from all of those minerals. So again, just point out what I, what I just said. We took a rock, we sterilized it, broke it open, um, and put that in media, and we are growing things out of rocks. So this is uh, kind of cool, right? Um, if you look inside a modern Great Salt Lake crystal, you can see bacteria and archaea cells. You can see cellular debris. The little arrows are pointing to DNA molecules. I'm not sure well, how well they're projecting, but you can see as cells died, how they left all their garbage behind. So in modern salt, you can see all of this. And we wanted to test what do you see in ancient salt, because we wanted to think a little more about this, um, uh, about uh, salt that might be on Mars that would be really ancient, right? Um, so we were curious about something called biosignatures. So if a cell is around and you find that cell or that microbe in the environment and you can grow it in the lab, great, you found life. But what if in Mars instead we don't find a cell? What if we find DNA or a virus or a piece of cellulose or lipids that survived over time? Would we still say that life was on Mars? If you found DNA on Mars, does that mean that life is on Mars? No, but it's a pretty strong indicator since the only way we make DNA naturally is on our planet is with DNA replication polymerases and that requires cellular life. So it would be um, indirect evidence of life and so we call these biosignatures, okay? So a signature that biology used to be there. So hold that in your, that concept in your mind and we'll come back to that. And you know, the top circle here, if you think about this over time, the top circle is, is saying that, hey, we'd really love to have DNA. If we can't find anything in an environment um, except you know, some proteins and stuff, we don't know much about, um, we don't, well, proteins we would know more, but if we just find some other carbohydrates and lipids and stuff, we might not know enough about the biology. But if you find DNA, you've got kind of the code to make the biology, right? So this is the best thing to find in terms of biosignatures, um, DNA, RNA, proteins, those kinds of things that indicate to a biologist what kind of life was present. If we might find other things though that said, hey, these molecules are only made by life forms, but we might not know what kind of life form. So that's kind of curious when you think about how biological signatures might manage over time and DNA uh, particularly RNA is really sensitive, but DNA is sensitive over time relative to some of these other things. So this work took me to Carlsbad, New Mexico, where I went underground about a half a mile and worked with a scientist that I had worked with closely in graduate school. Uh, his name is Jack Griffith at University of North Carolina. He's one of the world's best electron microscopists. And I said to him, I would like to pull out fluid from ancient salt fluid inclusions, put it on your EM grid directly without amplifying anything and see what's in there. And he said, I'm in. And he actually went with me down underground to collect salt samples. And we worked with the, um, a geologist who works on the Salado in New Mexico. Um, so, what we saw were these pockets of fluid. Uh, this is a picture we took from our, our, for our paper pointing to some of those fluid inclusions. If you look at the little video on the left, I'm gonna play it and watch carefully. There's a fluid pocket in the middle of that crystal and you can see it when I rock the crystal. 
you can see a little air bubble move. So there really is fluid inside these pockets. And we actually published this and made the cover of Astrobiology. It wasn't the same thing as the cover of Rolling Stone, which I've always hoped for. But I did get our pictures on the cover of Astrobiology, which is cool. Um, so we, made, uh, we took a, a dental drill and sterilized the bit and drilled into these fluid inclusions um, and sterilely sucked out the fluid that was inside. It was about 50 microliters most of the time. We went through hundreds of these. And uh, we put that on an EM grid and looked at it. Um, and we found lots of this molecule. And we were like, what is that? What is that molecule? Um, so we used that great scientific instrument, Google, and we found that this image matched others of cellulose. And so then we bought some enzyme called cellulase, which breaks down cellulose, and we tested it, and sure enough, it would clear the grid of any of these molecules. So we're looking at 253 million-year-old cellulose. Um, that's kind of a big deal. Do you know what cellulose is? I don't have any paper. Isn't that wild? Paper is cellulose, right? Um, where do we get cellulose from? Plants. Algae also make it. Um, it is a really difficult fiber um, to break down. It's very resistant. If you look at the protocols to how do I know if this is cellulose, it turns out that um, you, you need to, to break down the polymer. You need to use a really strong acid or a really strong base. So um, we had cellulose, lots of it, that was really old. It looks like it can hang around the environment. We also found DNA molecules. But these are 253 million year old DNA molecules. And if you were to um, work with a chemist to compute the probability of you know, how long would DNA survive in the environment, the people who've done those calculations have done them in water. And they say 10,000 years is max. Well, this is not water. This is in saturated salt inside a salt crystal protected from radiation, a half mile underground, right? So under those conditions, it looks like DNA can survive at least 253 million years. We don't know about lipids. We're working with um, some folks at NASA JPL on lipids and their ability to survive over geologic time. I say lipids because those carotenoid pigments that make these cells all pretty colors that I talked about are lipids. Um, and you actually can do um, a type of spectroscopy called Raman, which is an instrument that's on the Perseverance rover right now. So that's why it's of interest. So we have been uh, working with them on how to see inside salt minerals and see if we can detect lipids like these. Okay, so just to think about this for a minute, modern Great Salt Lake crystals, I showed you we could find bacteria and cells and cellular debris. Um, we're, currency, we're currently sequencing everything that can be contained inside gypsum crystals and halite crystals. Halite is another word for salt. Um, and in these ancient crystals, we didn't see cells anymore but we did see some biological molecules, cellulose and DNA. So keep that in mind when I talk about Mars and what we might be asking um, to survive. Uh, because if we now shift over to Mars, the last part of our story, um, we've got to think about Mars not just today, which is on your left, but what did Mars look like a long time ago? And that's more depicted on your right. Um, I never knew how much uh, space scientists worked with artists because um, conceptualizing planetary uh, bodies that you really can't see is, is um, useful work and it, it really helps us understand. So this is uh, a situation where we're trying to imagine what Mars looked like and it wasn't a desolate, dusty red place at that time. This was uh, a student of mine uh, did this uh, depiction for me, and I, I ended up in a uh, senior seminar course with one physics student because he didn't have a senior seminar 
that semester he was the only physics student graduating and I had a bunch of biologists and I said, well, let's, let's work on a chapter together. I could use your physics know-how. And uh, so he developed this figure for us and then um, Jojo, um, one of my students who's an artist, depicted it for us. So basically, um, there are people in the room that can explain this better than me, but the way Mars and Earth, um, again, the size bar is different here to show this, interact with solar flares is really different, solar winds, I mean. So, um, and it's really different because of something that happened on Mars where the magnetic poles shifted, um, and that caused Mars to lose its atmosphere. Um, and no longer can it um, have protection from these, these solar winds. So Earth, you can see, uh, even if you can't read these words or understand them, you can see it has levels of protection, right? Whereas Mars is just getting full frontal. So here's the timeline I want you to think about. Um, about 4.6 billion years ago, our solar system was formed, and Earth and Mars were really similar. They were in a similar zone. Um, we call it the habitable zone of our solar system. They were in a similar zone. They're rocky bodies. Um, uh, at the time, it wasn't habitable, so that was not back then, but now we call it a habitable area. Um, so the origin of Earth and Mars is about the same time, right? Um, I think we all can agree on that. And then about 3.5 billion years ago, that's when we estimate simple life started erupting on our planet. And that's when we have some fossil records of cyanobacteria, for example. Um, and so that's super interesting to me because as life is evolving here on our planet, erupting and then evolving, um, Mars looked really similar to Earth. It had a really similar interaction with the sun. It had an atmosphere. It was a live planet. It had tectonic plates. It had volcanoes. Um, and so it, it had the same conditions. So why couldn't life have also originated there? The other thing that's interesting to think about is that our planets have shared debris back and forth during uh, big asteroid collisions. Pieces of Mars have flown up and who's the next closest planet? That's us. We found pieces of Mars on our planet. So um, at least in dozens of meteorites that um, not only are they the chemical content of the Martian surface, but the, the gas inclusions inside, when you look at them and measure them, they are like Martian atmosphere. So um, so there's a lot of evidence to say that we have pieces of Mars on our planet. Likely we have pieces of Earth on Mars. Could we have shared microbes back and forth? Uh, I don't know, but it's certainly an open and a very cool scientific question. So now, what happens to Mars after that 3.5 billion, not million, 3.5 billion year ago mark is that's when its poles shift and it loses its atmosphere and it, over time, starts losing all of its standing surface water. So all these lakes and rivers that we have evidence for on Mars, geologic evidence, um, all of those disappear and evaporate. Um, now we have some frozen ice caps, so that's part of where the water went. We have some flowing brine on the surface of Mars. Um, I say brine because it is flowing, and at those cold temperatures, the only water that can flow um, is very high salt, right? That's why we put salt on the sidewalks and on our streets in the wintertime. Um, maybe there's some subsurface water, but there's not a lot of water on Mars. Uh, the tectonic plates have stopped moving. There's a little bit of tectonic activity, but not much. Um, and we have all of the salts and minerals on Mars that are in these old lake beds. So even if you look at Endurance Crater, where one of the early rovers Opportunity explored, um, you can tell that's a lake. Now everything's covered in this iron dust, so it's not shining white like Bonneville Salt Flats, but when you do the little rover geology test, 
Um, you can see minerals there, and they identified uh, gypsum there, um, and possibly uh, halite, which again is sodium chloride. So there are little places where like salt crystals used to be, but were dissolved um, in some of their images. That's what we think they are. Um, so Gale Crater is another really interesting place. Uh, this was the rover Curiosity, which was a big rover like Perseverance. And uh, it went to Gale Crater and it looked at these sedimentary rocks that are in this area and found loads of minerals and talked about it. Uh, the geologists who study this talk about it as an ancient salty lake about 3.7 billion years ago. Um, some gypsum crystals at Great Salt Lake on your left, gypsum crystals on Mars on the right. Um, so some analogs. Why do I say salt lakes on Mars? How come they couldn't be freshwater lakes? Well, they probably were a lot of them freshwater lakes first, um, but then as the water evaporated over time, what happened to Lake Bonneville? It got saltier and saltier and saltier, right? Until it makes Salt Lake at the bottom of the puddle. So um, what, what happened was this lake dried up, the water got saltier and saltier, and therefore um, it had to get more salty before it left and evaporate behind. So there was a period of time on Mars where there probably were a lot of salt lakes, which I find fascinating. If there had been microbes swimming around in that water, even if it was in the fresh water, that life would have had to have evolved over time to live in higher and higher and higher salt concentrations, very much like the life we see in Great Salt Lake. So that's why I get really excited when I think about these salty evaporates on Mars, and I remember my friend, Halo Archaea, who has all these superpowers. So we're looking for two things. Um, a couple years ago, I went to a NASA conference on extant life. Um, extant means existing. Extinct means it's gone away. So if we're looking for existing life, extant life, where should we look? And our group at this NASA meeting was looking at salts as a potential place. Um, and, and we're wondering, can these microbes live dormantly inside those minerals like the ones we find around Great Salt Lake? Um, and if they can't, if, if 3.5 billion years was too much time, for them to still be alive, maybe they left some of their molecules behind and we can go find those molecules. So we're curious about um, if DNA and cellulose, for example, can survive, and in some cases, cells, microbial cells, can survive from the Permian age on our planet. Isn't it possible that they could survive over geologic time on Mars? And I think the answer is yes, but I think 3.5 billion years is a big ask for biology to hang around, right? Um, so I want to end this talk by um, just talking about who's there now. Percy is on the ground and is working with his friend, uh, her friend, I should say. They've, they've genderized Perseverance as a her. Um, uh, her friend Ingenuity, the little helicopter drone that's also flying around and helping uh, to find sites to drive to. Um, Perseverance has an instrument on it that does Raman spectroscopy because you have to have an acronym on every instrument at NASA, it seems. They call it Sherlock, and I can't remember. Um, that's what it stands for, scanning habitable, habitable environments with Raman and luminescence. So it's looking for organics. And when it finds organic molecules, that doesn't mean those organics necessarily are biological molecules, but they could be. And it's helping guide where Perseverance will drill all of its core samples. Um, so the site is an ancient lake, Jezero Crater. And Jezero Crater uh, would have gotten saltier and saltier, and we know it left some evaporates behind. Uh, this is a picture from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that's taking pictures and does uh, infrared photography from around Mars. 
Uh, and the um, gypsum has an IR signature, so the green in the picture is actually gypsum minerals, and so we know that some of these evaporates are in this area, which on Earth we would say that indicates water used to be there, and it looks like a river delta, so it's very exciting that we're exploring this area right now on Mars. This was from before um, they gave Perseverance a name when they called it Mars 2020. Basically, Perseverance would land was the idea, and then it would drive to a site of interest, and then it would dig a little core sample, and then it would drive to what NASA calls the cache, I call it the parking lot, <laughs> and it would drop off um, these little core samples, and then it would drive to another site of interest, and then it would come back and drop it. Um, right now, I think what's happening is that the Perseverance is actually dropping the the core and marking the location, but not driving it back to a common pile. Um, we're working with, uh, when I say we, I mean the Royal We USA. NASA is working with uh, the European Space Agency, ESA, on a retrieval mission. Uh, ESA is building a little tiny fetch rover. This is like it's seriously sci-fi. So uh, we can send something to Mars every two years. That's when the window of our planets being close to each other makes it feasible. Um, and so in, in a couple years, I guess next summer, we will launch a mission from ESA, which will send a lander, which will land, and it will open and out will come the little fetch rover. It will know all of the locations where all the samples are. It will drive around Jezero Crater pick up all the samples, take them back to the lander, which has a rocket, which will shoot it into orbit. And then I think we send some space cowboys or something to go like lasso it from orbit and bring it back. That part is not clear yet. Um, maybe Elon Musk is waiting in his space Tesla. Mm. Um, so just to finish this, I mean, really what we're saying is, um, 3.5 billion years ago, Mars had epic climate change, um, spurred by this shift in the magnetic poles. And Earth now, we're experiencing climate change and these salt lakes are drying up. So we have an opportunity to watch what happens and think about how life gets preserved in the mineral record. Um, so if, if aquatic microbial life was in water on Mars, that life had to become tolerant to salt as that water dried up. And that's the basic thesis of my point here today, um, because that means the life that was left behind on Mars might very well, the last life that could have been on Mars might very well look like our Halo Archaea from Great Salt Lake. And I'm really curious to see when these salt samples come back in, I don't know, uh, probably five to 10 year window, um, see what's inside them. So uh, I have two main conclusions, and one is about the lake and one is about Halo Archaea. I think Great Salt Lake makes a great analog site to think about um, these places on Mars where evaporites exist. Um, and I think Halo Archaea make a really good model for astrobiology purposes to think about what life at an extreme place like underground on Mars might look like. So when I see Great Salt Lake and I'm looking at a sunset, I'm often thinking about Mars. <laughs> I've listed some references here from some of the work that we've done um, that I told you about. And also, um, I want to give an acknowledgement to my collaborator at NASA, Scott Pearl, and my collaborator at University of North Carolina, um, Jack Griffith, and our funding um, for some of these projects. Some of the students who did some of the field work that we talked about, Adric, Dan, uh, and uh, are now in medical school, and Erin is on her way next year to medical school. Um, so just some of the many students who have worked with us on this project, and I would love to entertain any questions that you have. Uh, is there any life on Earth that could survive on Mars? 
like any chance microbes on these rovers? I can't uh, see where your question, oh, there you are, hey. Um, yeah, so good, good question. So um, this is actually the reason when NASA started in 1958, they had an astrobiology section. It was called exobiology. And it was um, suggested by a famous microbial geneticist um, uh, called Joshua Lederberg. Um, who would have thought that a molecular geneticist or a microbial geneticist would be involved with NASA at that point? But he said, if you're gonna, if you're gonna build space equipment and send it out, you've gotta worry about microbes going out as well. So that's your question, right? Like, do we, yeah. So uh, Joshua Lederberg also suggested that there was this young grad student that NASA should take a look at, and that happened to be Carl Sagan. So some of you in the room might know about Cosmos and Carl Sagan. Um, so I think it's kind of cool, because the birth of astrobiology happened for this very reason that you're pointing to. Um, today, NASA has clean rooms where they try to keep the equipment as biologically free as possible. Um, they swab the equipment constantly. So once the machinery gets to a point where it's about to be launched, it is kept in these clean rooms and there are these protocols where they swab it and look for microbes that are on the equipment and keep track of what can survive through their cleaning techniques and what cannot. The result is yes, we do send microbes um, out into space. Uh, some of them will probably survive on our equipment. Some of them are spore formers that can survive um, lots of bad extremes, right? So uh, we, uh, we know we're sending life out there. So what you have to do then is have a control sample, right? So you have to know that something that's uh, on the space equipment probably is not going to jump off on Mars and thrive. Um, but it could. You have to have constant um, test of the equipment, um, what's present on there, what kind of DNA is there, and compare that with your sample so that becomes your standard. So I think that um, you're pointing to an excellent question. If we find it, will we know it's really from Mars? <laughs> right? And we have, to, we have to be ready for that. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, the question is, have Halo Archaea been tested in space? Very good question, and yes, they have. So um, back in the day of the space shuttle mission, um, there was a series of experiments called EXPOSE, um, where they would send up a panel and they could load the panel with whatever. Um, they go to the space station, and then they would expose those panels to space conditions for a couple of weeks, and then they would bring those panels back to Earth, and you could compete for what went on those panels. And actually, brine shrimp got to go to space. They do this insisted phase. This was long before I lived in Utah. Um, they do this insisted phase, and they wanted to know, would brine shrimp hatch if you brought them back? And you could grow sea monkeys that have been to space. And, and sure enough, they did. They survived. Um, but Halo Archaea also got to go to space. Uh, this particular species um, is from the San Francisco salt ponds and not from Great Salt Lake. Um, but it did, and my friend uh, Rocco Mancinelli at NASA Ames led that e experiment. And so halophiles have been to space. Good question. And they survived. They survived. And they are the only vegetative cells to do so, non or formers to do so. So that's kind of interesting. Thank, thank you for your questions. We really appreciate Dr. Baxter coming and visiting with us. Would you please um, show your appreciation? Thank you. Thanks very much. We're, we're out of time now, so if you need to go to your next class, that's fine. But if you'd like to come up and talk with Dr. Mm -hmm. Baxter, please feel free. Thank you so much.